of the note. It had fallen down right here on the front of this. And I did not see it. Emma Grace Hicks. Eight pounds, three ounces. I've even got Amanda's cell phone number on there. <laughs> well, I called the hospital yesterday and, and talked to, uh, to Amanda. And she filled me in on everything. And she said she had lots of company there with her and all of that and uh, but she was of course concerned about the baby and wanted to be with her but we had several families out this morning as you well know let's remember all of them daily bible reader count raise your hand please start with me mike you get me now I was joking about getting Steve Harper and Dennis Hackett together. Darlene said, just don't bring them to my house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, baby. <clears throat> Jackie called this morning and told me that he had thought that he would maybe be able to be here, but he was just not feeling well at all, and he had made preparation for his study, and I noticed that you were supposed to study a lesson about Paul and the Ephesian elders, and I would have probably presented that lesson if I had had a little bit more time to prepare, but uh, I had not had the opportunity to look at it. We have been studying in our young adult class downstairs some of the material in the issue of the spiritual sword that had to do with the doctrine of final things, and uh, we have been, I gave all the people in our class one of these charts of uh, the state of man and you know, where are the dead and all that. This is a chart that has been around and I have used it many times over the years. Uh, it takes us all the way from birth to eternity. Uh, we come into the world and uh, as an infant we are safe. We're not saved because we have had no sin. Uh, babies are not born in sin. And uh, we, uh, uh, we took that statement, and we have looked at the statement that is made where David says that in sin did my mother conceive me and so on. And we pointed out, uh, have, have learned by looking at uh, the Old Testament, that David was the tenth, generation uh, of the descendants of Judah and uh, Judah you remember uh, fathered a child by Tamar and as such if you count ten generations from Judah David was the tenth generation and the descendants were not allowed to go in to the tabernacle and so on uh, and enjoy some of the benefits that the other uh, Israelites did. And David was the tenth generation. So he bore the iniquity of Judah to the tenth generation. And it is my conviction, the conviction of a lot of others, that that is that statement in Psalm 51 about in sin did my mother conceive me. It's not that David was born guilty as an infant. And some people would use that passage erroneously and mis misapply it to try to prove that a child is born totally depraved. And we know that that is not logical nor scriptural because Jesus said except you be converted and become as this little child you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven well if that child was born totally depraved then Jesus would be saying except you be converted and become totally depraved you're not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven 
children are not guilty of sin because sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. So we would ask, what law has a little child committed? Now, since she's the latest, we have a lot of little children here. Uh, little Emma Grace. What sin has she committed? None. She was not born in sin. She was not born a sinner. She was born an innocent child. Now that's how we come into the world. When we reach that age of accountability, uh, we are either going to stay uh, pleasing to God and become one of his children through the process that we talked about this morning. We're saved from our sins. Uh, we know that the person as they grow either will enter into the kingdom of God or they will enter into the kingdom of the devil. They'll either be in the, the Lord's family, the church, in his body, the church, or they will be in the world, which is the kingdom of Satan. So you become either a member of the kingdom of God or you become or you stay in the kingdom of Satan. Which you uh, you know, you, you come to a recognition of sin. We all I remember vividly the time when I began to realize, you know, there's something not right here. And uh, I didn't obey the gospel when I needed to. I knew that I needed to probably a couple of years before I did. I knew, I knew exactly what was going on. I heard the gospel preached for years. Uh, when one enters into the kingdom, the church, uh, he can backslide and go back into the kingdom of Satan. Or he can stay faithful and remain faithful. But all are going to die. But when an infant dies, where does he go? Well, that child is innocent. He's saved. He clearly, or she goes into the paradise, as it's called. And those in the kingdom of God will die. And they leave the physical body, they go into paradise. The physical body goes to the tomb, we know. The spirit, the soul, goes to be with God. And uh, there are two compartments. Death of backsliders and hypocrites and those in the kingdom of Satan take them into the place of torments or Tartarus, as it's called. You have two compartments of that intermediate stage. Death... Sometimes people erroneously say, well, so-and-so has gone to heaven. Well, I don't think the Bible teaches that. I don't think we go directly to heaven when we die because you have several passages that deal with the intermediate stage. We've already studied all those downstairs, and I, I don't want to rehearse all of them. But any of you that want a copy of this chart, I'll be glad to get it to you. And I think you would appreciate the study of it. You remember Jesus said to the thief on the cross, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Uh, we found out in our studies that he and the thief both went to paradise, obviously. His body was not in paradise because his body is said to have been in the tomb during that time, prior to his resurrection. And when you study carefully the statement made by Peter in Acts 2, you have a distinction drawn between his soul and his body. His body did not stay in the tomb long enough to see corruption. It did not decay, deteriorate, decompose. We use that word a lot. But his soul and body were reunited. They weren't in the same place. Because he and the thief, he said, would be in paradise. And uh, 
there's several passages that denote that the angels sinned and they've been reserved in chains and darkness until the judgment. That denotes that there is an evil or a place for the evil to abide. And we know that the rich man was said to be in torments. And the word there is Tartarus. Tartarus we sometimes pronounce it. Uh, it is a place of, of torment. Uh, then the judgment day is going to come. But what about those who have not died? They're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, 1 Corinthians 15. You've heard that passage quoted probably and used in reference to conversion. It's not about that. It's not about conversion from sin to Christ. It's about being converted from a mortal to an immortal, from a, a dishonorable to an honorable body. That change, uh, I've had people quote that why. Uh, conversion is in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And I said, wait a minute, you're, you're misapplying that passage because it says at the last trump that's going to occur. When Jesus comes, that's going to occur. And it's talking about those who are alive and remain when Jesus comes. Because the mortal body cannot inherit immortality. It's going to be changed and become a, a mortal body. Brother Denton Ramsey had made the statement, you know, I am tired of living in this old body. I've been hurting so long. I want a new body. Well, we're all going to have a new body. But when you look at the place of torment, uh, uh, well, let's go on with just a minute. Go through the judgment day. Jesus comes again. There's going to be a day of judgment. The saved are going to go to heaven. The lost will be sent to Gehenna, which is a different word from Tartarus. Or to Tartarus. The uh, word Gehenna denotes the everlasting, eternal place, the abode of the wicked. While heaven where few will enter, comparatively speaking. Gehenna will be eternal punishment. It will be the second death. It will be everlasting destruction. And the same word is used for heaven in Matthew 25, uh, 46, as is used for hell. Both are said to be eternal or everlasting without end. There are those who teach that hell is just going to be a place of annihilation where a person will be conscious for just a short time and then it's over. But that's not the depiction that Jesus gives in the scriptures of hell. It's going to be just as long as heaven is. If heaven is everlasting and eternal, then hell is also everlasting and eternal. But uh, one of the things that I was going to talk to our class downstairs about today is this word is torments, plural. And I think we would all do well to think for a moment about some of the torments that will be characteristic of those who suffer everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. The individual told me not long ago, I would like to hear a sermon on hell because I haven't heard one in a long time. That person lives somewhere else. And I told him, I said, well, I wish you had been with us a couple of weeks ago because we took a look into the abyss. I don't know if you saw any of you remember that sermon or not. But we did. We, we took a look into the abyss. Talking about, we illustrated it by those glass bridges that you can walk out on, you know, and look down into those chasms. And that's, that's what we tried to do by actually looking at that terrible place called hell. But think about that word torments for a minute. What would be some of the torments 
that a person like the rich man that Jesus talked about in the book of Luke in connection with Lazarus, the beggar, who was laid at his gate, laid at the rich man's gate every day, and he just desired the crumbs from the rich man's table. Lazarus was not a demanding person. He didn't ask for a lot. He asked for only the crumbs. He didn't ask for a full-fledged meal. One of the interesting things about that, and sometimes I think we make an assumption, we assume the rich man didn't give him any crumbs. It isn't stated that the rich man refused to give him any crumbs. It's not really said that he did. But even if he gave him crumbs, it wasn't enough. He should have given him more, should he? I mentioned to our class last week downstairs, you remember the story of Mephibosheth? When David sought him out, this man was a crippled descendant of Saul. He would have been Saul's great-grandson. Saul had died, and uh, a lot of his family, no doubt, were deeply concerned because they thought the new king, David, since Saul had tried to kill him, David would probably try to kill Saul, or Saul's descendants. And you remember David sent an entourage and brought Mephibosheth to his place. And he brought him in and set him down to a fine and sumptuous meal, which kings would often do, and then turn around and kill their guests. But David said, you're going to be at my table from now on. And you're going to eat what we eat. You're going to dine with us. It's going to be just like it was when your father Jonathan was living. You know, remember when Jonathan said, I can't come anymore, David. David said, your seat will be empty and you will be missed. Mephibosheth no doubt had a lot of misgivings about being taken to David's place and palace. But David brought him in and treated him royally. He said, you're in effect going to live with me from now on. You're going to be a member of the royal family. David was so much bigger man than Saul was, though Saul no doubt dwarfed him in size. But David was a good man in that regard. He made his mistakes. We all know them well. But uh, you think about that kind of behavior. Uh, Lazarus the beggar just asked for the crumbs off his table. But sometimes we can sin by not giving. We may give some, but we may not give enough. And the rich man did not show the compassion and the mercy and so on that he should have. But when he was in Tartarus, he looked far off and saw Abraham with Lazarus in his bosom. And have you ever thought about uh, the torment of a troubled mind? You ever met, ever, ever met anybody that was really troubled in mind? They had a lot of things going on in their lives. We all do have that to some degree at one time or another, don't we? Jesus was concerned about that. In John 14, he said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Look there, the troubled heart, right there. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. You remember that passage in John 14, 1 through 3. A very comforting passage. But so many people have tormented minds. Well, what were some of the torments now through which the rich man no doubt went? Well, one would be the torment of what might have been. So many times we think, I'd say all of us have it one time, right? we think about what might have been if this, that, or the other had really been realized. 
But here was a man who could look and see Abraham and Lazarus. The roles of Lazarus and the rich man are flip-flopped here. The rich man enjoyed all the good things in life. Lazarus was very poor. He evidently didn't have good health. He uh, didn't have sufficient food. He may not have had, you know, that much of a family, whatever. Not very many comforts in life anyway. The rich man was clothed in purple and fine linen. He lived sumptuously every day. He may have had the very best food that you could imagine. May have had a beautiful house with all the luxuries of his day. But now he sees that the comforts of life are not nearly as important as the comforts of the hereafter. I think that's a lesson that we all need to learn, don't we? We, we spend a lot of time thinking about, boy, I'll tell you what, I wish I had a better riding vehicle. I wish I had a more comfortable chair. You, you just go on and on and on. Uh, I'm, I'm more concerned about comfort now than I am appearance. I don't think too much about how shoes look, and that thing keeps popping. I, I think more about how they feel, don't you? A lot of you are already there with me. You, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, style used to be the thing, but, you know, not anymore. Think about the torment of neglected opportunities. Here's a man that had the opportunity to really make a difference in somebody's life, but he didn't take advantage of it. And now he is suffering. And... Uh, the rich man learns that God has the power to comfort people of this earth in ways that they will never find in this life. But maybe he said, I could have made a difference. He, I could have made a difference. But he didn't. Think about the torment of what will never be. He said, I'd love for you to send Lazarus and let him dip the tip of his finger in water and just cool my tormented tongue. Have you ever awakened at night when your tongue is so dry and parched that it, it sticks to the roof of your mouth and you think, whew, what I would give for a cool drink of water. The rich man didn't ask for a lot. He didn't ask for a bottle of water. You know, bring me a bottle of water. Drive through McDonald's. Drive through and lots of times I'll say, I want a bottle of water. And they'll say, well, I can get you a cup of ice with some water. No, I want a bottle of water. See, I'm wanting what I want. I want, I want a bottle of cold water. Sometimes what they put in, on the ice, now Barbara likes stuff on the ice, but uh, the stuff that you put on ice, it takes a while for the straws down in the bottom of it, and what you pull up, that first sip or two is warm. It hadn't gotten cold yet. But water satisfies thirst like nothing else does. This man wanted water. But Abraham said, <clears throat> can't be done. There is a great gulf between us. I illustrated it last week by standing on one side of the Grand Canyon and looking to the other and seeing that chasm between. Think of some dear loved one <coughs> that was on the other side and you wanted to be with them. You might have to have binoculars to see them. But you want to be together, but you can't be. Because that chasm, when he said that great guff, is far greater than the Grand Canyon. But 
it was not so far that he couldn't see because he looked and saw Abraham and Lazarus in his bed. He could see it. Remember, Moses saw the panoramic view of the promised land, but he never experienced it. And you think how, how frightful that is. That would be so troubling, wouldn't it? Remember, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. God can take away those troubles. Satan can't. The rich man was now tormented. He was troubled. But there was no comfort for him. I think we all need to think about those things. Think about... How terrible the torment would be to think of what might have been. Think about the torment of thinking, oh, what will never be. Really something for all of us to think about. The torment of seeing and never experiencing. And I use the illustration, I've used it before in the, in the auditorium in a lesson, I think, of one night during our annual singing, I had to go out of the parking lot to get something. And I, when I was out in the parking lot, I could hear no singing at all. I came in the back door of the annex. When I opened that door, I could hear the singing faintly. When I opened the first door through there, the metal door, it was even a little louder. When I came through that one, everybody's voices hit me full blast, and it was so beautiful. I could hear it faintly. The rich man could see across that cabin. He evidently could hear because he understood Abraham, didn't he? Think about hearing that great singing that will be in heaven. And knowing that you can never experience that. That would be torments, wouldn't it? Thank you for being here and being a part of our Bible study program. We hope that you will be back tonight. If you need one of those charts, I have a few right here.